Please be seated. As a culture, I think, we are very interested in leadership. Not just in the church, but in the world around us. We are interested in information about how to lead, what leadership looks like, stories about leadership, hints, guides, oh, anything that may help us. Whether we are entrusted with some form of leadership ourselves or just want to understand leadership better. Many people say they have something to teach us about leadership. Look at the New York Times book review and notice how many of the non-fiction bestsellers are about leadership. Some of it seems fun, but sometimes a little less meaty, perhaps. For example, don't forget your cape, what preschoolers teach us about leadership and life. I googled what babies teach us about leadership, but nothing came up. <laughs> Yet, maybe someone here can write that book. By the way, what preschoolers teach us is be a superhero, don't be afraid to fail, and play games. Now, since preschoolers have their own leadership style, and in honor of Bishop Rabb, I looked for leadership lessons from animals. <laughs> no book yet, but I did find a website that lists leadership lessons from dogs. Avoid biting when a simple growl will do. <laughs> if what you want is buried, dig deep until you find it. Never pass up an opportunity to go for a joy ride. And when someone is having a bad day, be silent, sit close by, and nuzzle them gently. <laughs> Bishop Rab, you will be happy to know that the entry about what cats teach us is longer. <laughs> One thing cats' leadership style teaches is that it is not always necessary to please people. <laughs> Cats are not afraid to say no. Joshua, son of Nun, was not afraid to say no. He was not afraid to do what he felt called to do and to insist that others be faithful and act with integrity as well. He was not afraid to speak the truth, even when the truth sounded ridiculous, unlikely, or just plain scary. Back when Moses was still the leader of the Israelites and they were doing some reconnaissance on the Promised Land, the Hebrew spies came back complaining, those people are giants. We look like grasshoppers next to them. Then all the people start their by now familiar complaint God, why did you bring us out of Egypt if only you had let us die back there? They actually look around for a captain to start leading them back to Egypt. Then Joshua and his friend Caleb stand up and say something along the lines of, What part of God is with you, don't you understand? What part of God has led you this far, with signs and wonders and faithfulness, don't you get? Don't be afraid. By the way, in response, the whole congregation threatened to stone them. <laughs> After Moses died and Joshua was put in charge, Joshua trusted God to bring down the walls of Jericho using only a bunch of priests blowing trumpets and the people marching around the city a grand total of 13 times and then yelling their heads off. 
Joshua must, be, must have been working on his rhetorical skills because this time, when Joshua told them God's plan, they actually did it. Maybe they thought they had nothing to lose. Maybe they were beginning to trust. Either way, those walls come tumbling down. This morning, we hear Joshua's farewell speech. Joshua is honest with the Israelites about their commitment to God. Just before the part we heard, Joshua reminds them of all the things God has done for them. How God heard the cries that they sent up while they were slaves in Egypt. How God had compassion for them. How God saved them from their enemies who were stronger than they. He reminds them that all they have is gift from God. Not their own doing or their own accomplishment. He says to them, Thus says the Lord, when I gave all this to you, it was not by your sword or by your bow. I gave you a land on which you had not labored and towns you had not built. You eat the fruit of vineyards and olive yards you did not plant. Now, Therefore, revere the Lord, serve the Lord in sincerity and faithfulness. Choose this day whom you will serve. False gods, false hopes, false dreams, false goals. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. How about you? The people respond enthusiastically, yes, we will too. But Joshua does not leap at their first response. Instead, he tells them three times that the covenant they make with God is a costly one. There are consequences to breaking it. Serving the Lord our God is no light matter. Maybe Joshua can be so honest because when he was commissioned by God, this is how it went. The Lord commissioned Joshua, son of Nun, be strong and bold. For you shall bring the Israelites into the land that I promised them. I will be with you. By the way, the people managed to keep their promises for all of the next two whole chapters of the Bible. <laughs> Talitha Arnold, an ordained minister in the UCC, has written that if she were more like Joshua, more honest and upfront with the community she leads, she would be a little more detailed when parents bring their children for baptism. She writes, I would ask more than the generic, do you promise to grow with this child in the Christian faith and offer him or her the nurture of the Christian church? Instead, I would ask in front of God and the whole congregation, do you promise to get her out of bed, dressed, and here every Sunday morning for the next 18 years, even when you've had a long week, or you'd rather sleep in, or there's a soccer match, or when this darling infant has grown into a surly, tattooed teenager who thinks church is dumb. She says, had Joshua presided at my ordination, I doubt he would have let me get by with a simple vow to study, pray, teach, and preach. He probably would have demanded, will you give up your personal gods? of procrastination, perfectionism, and the pursuit of trivia. I will, with God's help. And that's the amazing thing, isn't it? With God's help. We all undertake vows to serve God as lay people, as deacons, as priests, as bishops, as leaders, 
making huge promises to God, who loves us, a holy, jealous, demanding, and thanks be to God, Joshua knows better now, I'm sure, forgiving and merciful God, who promises to help us, who promises that everything will be better if we never try to go it without God's help. For the sake of this God, for the love of this God, we answer yes, hoping to make it at least two chapters before we have to repent again. I guess that's why looking to preschoolers for patterns of leadership seems a little lightweight. Not that we can't learn from children. It can happen all the time if we're open to it. But letting preschoolers be in charge is another thing altogether. We need not be shy about claiming grown-up leadership to help God raise grown-up disciples, mature servants of Christ, who know, who know that joy and wonder are not childish. They may be the fruits of a mature, living faith. The God who stood by Joshua, the God who commissioned him with the words, Be strong and bold, I will be with you, is the same God who stood by Saul, better known to us as Paul. Stood by Saul, that is, after knocking him to the ground, blind and unable to eat for three days, and leading Ananias to him. Saul finds himself defenseless in the hands of one of the Christians whose arrest warrants is still in his back pocket. Ananias must have had his own interesting leadership decisions to make that day. What do I do for the good of this community? Our enemy has been delivered into my hands. What do I do? The Lord tells Ananias, feed him, teach him. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Saul becomes Paul, sent by the Lord to bring his name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel, as Acts puts it. And Paul writes today's prescription for faithful discipleship. Great guide for faithful leadership. From prison, a prescription filled with joy. Rejoice always. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. Do not worry about anything. Pray. Keep on doing the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. The Lord is near, says Paul. The Lord is near. Don't worry. This same God is with us still. Jesus, our good shepherd, is near. And, as in the case of the Israelites, as in the case of the early churches, this good shepherd, the one in whom all leadership finds its true and worthy pattern, still has work for us to do. There are other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also. And they will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock, one shepherd. The need for bold and faithful leaders did not stop with Paul. The promise to be with us did not stop then either. Be strong. Be bold. Be honest. Rejoice always. The Lord is near. We are here 
this morning to give thanks to God for raising up for us a faithful bishop in God's church. Bishop John Rabb's ministry has been marked by inspiring teaching, faithful preaching, insightful pastoring. Bishop Rabb, you have been a man of prayer among us, an example for us, and we know praying for us also. Your commitment to ministries in our cities and in the rural parishes of Maryland, your work on behalf of ecumenism, health ministries, Christian formation, all have served the people of this diocese and the Episcopal Church. You have exhorted the priests, deacons, and all the people of God to continue our call to study, to pray, preach, and proclaim with boldness, trusting in the goodness and power of the God whom we serve. Your ministry alongside your partner, Sharon Rabb, as she has exercised her own leadership of clergy families in this diocese and her own faithful membership and participation here in her home parish, all give us examples of faithful servant leadership. Thank you. As you enter the next part of your journey as a servant and leader of God's people, may you continue to know the presence of God with you. And we pray in the words of Paul, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen.